Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Man, I'm excited uh, for today. Uh, uh, you know, this is the best I've been feeling on a Sunday morning for a long time. The past few weeks I've been, you know, I haven't been feeling the best. I've been tired and, and today I'm feeling energized and ready. And so I'm excited for today um, where what I think God wants to do. But I'm Dustin. I'm the lead pastor here at Known. And it's an honor that you're here with us today. It's an honor that you're joining us online today. And we're in the midst of a series we started a couple weeks ago called The Locked Door. And, and we're going through some of the biggest uh, things that we often lock ourselves in as human beings. Some of the th most common things that we kind of get trapped in or we get lost in. And these are things like fear and th things like busyness and things like anger and unforgiveness and even just the mundane or bitterness and chaos and pride, addiction, apathy, right? Some of the things that we tend to get locked in as people. Now, how do we get locked in, in, the, in this is really interesting because, because it kind of comes out in, the, in, this, in, a, in a process of things that happened to us when we were children, some of the things that we've gone through as adults, some of those hardships we've had. And so what happens is as people, when life comes, as we all know life does, when life comes, the way that we try to protect ourselves or the way that we try to make sure that we're going to be okay, the way we try and get comfortable is if something scares us, if we see something that we don't like about ourselves, what do we do? We try and hide it. We try and lock behind the, or hide behind the door, lock the door, throw away the key. I hope nobody sees this part of who I am. I don't want people to see it. So we try and hide from it. And what happens when we try and hide from it, we start hiding from each other. If you remember, go back to the beginning is, is this moment where Eve eats the apple and then Adam's like, yeah, I want to try it and they eat this fruit. And, and then what happens is they see God coming. What do they do? They hide themselves. They clothe themselves. They lock themselves away and they don't, they don't realize what's actually happening. And we've been doing this since the beginning of time of trying to hide our, our, our deepest insecurities and our deepest weaknesses. My hope and my prayer is that through this series, we can learn how to open the door and be vulnerable. And our vision as a church, one of our visions is to, to, to be a place that anyone can call home. And what this means is that we need to be vulnerable with one another. And what's interesting about this series is that a lot of the things I'm talking about today are things that I'm, I'm locked in or have been locked in in my life at some point or the other. We're going to be going through so many things, and, and I want to share, I'm, when I'm sharing these messages, it's not because I'm standing here being like, look at me, I figured it out. I'm saying almost like a let's do it together, let's figure it out together, because it's not always easy. It's not always easy when, you, when you're locked in fear and you don't know how to open the door. When, when, when life just scares you and things are coming up that kind of trigger you or bring you back to a moment that was, that was so tough in your life. We need to learn that it's not safer to lock ourselves behind the door, but we got to open the door and start to live the abundant, fruitful life that God has called us to live. Because what's happened is we've become so comfortable in the prison that we don't even want to escape. We're so comfortable in, it, in fear, or we're so comfortable in unforgiveness, or we're so comfortable in it. That's the only place that we feel like we can live because it's the safest place we, th we think we can be. Because if fear is all we know, that's where we're going to feel the most comfortable. We will intentionally or we might even unintentionally pursue fear so that we, way we can feel comfortable. Because that's all we know. Even if it's not where we're supposed to live, that's what we're used to. And so that's where we'll try and settle and that's where we'll try and live. If busyness is all we know, that rest often seems like a myth or a thing only for people who are weak. We often say things like, I'm too busy to rest. I'll rest when I'm dead. You ever heard someone say that? It's like, you're going to make it there a lot quicker, man. Got to learn how to rest in our life. Because if it's all we have known our whole lives, it feels weird or odd to try and open the door. It's like, it's like leaving your house when you don't want to. 
to go to that meeting and you're like, I don't want to even open the door. I don't want to get out of here. It's comfortable here. I can wear my PJs. I can watch my show. I can eat my popcorn. I don't want to leave. And I think we've, we've kind of set up camp behind locked doors oftentimes. It often goes against our very nature to pursue the opposite of what we know. Because we're so comfortable in our dysfunction, so comfortable in our pain, so comfortable behind the locked door that we don't even know what freedom tastes like. We don't even know what joy feels like. We don't even know what what the abundant life God is offering us is like because we've trapped ourselves or we've locked ourselves behind the door. Today we're going to be talking about unforgiveness. Now, we've talked about unforgiveness, you know, many times, and why? Well, I think Jesus was preaching on earth for three years, and he talked about unforgiveness a lot, too. Why? Because it's a human problem. We're not good at forgiving. We're often quick to anger and slow to forgive. And you notice this, if you go through life, forgiveness is not always easy. It's not easy, to be honest, pretty much ever is it easy to learn how to forgive, But this idea of the locked door, just a quick recap, uh, comes from John 20, verse 19. And it says this, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors. Why? Because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And the disciples, right, they're so afraid. They're so nervous about what the future might look like that they've locked themselves in the room. For them, the best option to combat the fear was to hide So the question is, what have you locked yourself behind? It may be recent. It may be something you've been locked behind for years or even decades. Decades of fear, decades of apathy, or decades of living. Just this mundane space, dreaming for more, but settling for less. Or maybe it's decades of abuse and a lack of forgiveness. See, Jesus doesn't want us to live our lives locked behind the door. God has created us for so much more. We're to live our lives full and live our lives free. But we often settle for less because we don't know how to unlock the door. And let's talk about forgiveness. And I think one of the greatest examples of forgiveness in human history really comes from Jesus is Luke chapter 23, verse 34. This is Jesus hanging on the cross. And every time I read this verse, sorry, I get... It always makes me emotional, but Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And the response and all the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The story, again, always kind of brings emotion to me. It always speaks to me the beauty of a broken, humiliated man, whipped, beaten, hanging beside two criminals, See, Jesus is in a place where no one dreams for their worst enemy here. And on our Savior's lips, on our King's lips is forgiveness. He's saying, they don't even understand. Father, they don't even get it. They don't understand the magnitude of this moment. They don't understand the beauty of this moment. They They don't get it yet. So forgive them. Forgiveness. Father, forgive them And so the question is, how do I, how do you, how do we get to a place where we can actually say that same prayer? I think some of us, when we look at our past and we look at some of the people in our life that we're struggling to forgive, that same prayer of Father, forgive them, is not even close to what's coming out of our lips. I've been in places where unforgiveness has reigned deep in my life. And the last thing I could think of is praying that prayer, Father, forgive them. The people who have hurt me the most and the people who abandoned me and the people that I thought would be there that weren't and this deep sense of of pain that kind of comes up and my first prayer is usually not, Father, forgive them. It's more like, Father, get them, you know. Get them. Sick of Jesus, right? Like, for real. Like, now nah, I can't be the only one who's straight prayers like that. Right? Like, I, I can't be the only one who's been like, God, like, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven over them, you know? And I know what your will is because it's my will too, right? How do we get to a place where that's our prayer as well? 
Now, I'm going to say this to be honest. It's not easy. It's not easy. Remember, Jesus is in his most humiliating, painful moment of his life on the cross between two criminals who deserve to be there. And he says, Father, forgive them. And they don't even acknowledge it. They just start gambling for his clothes. I think forgiveness might actually be one of the hardest things to, for us to do and for us to follow through with. We love retribution, right? We do. We love revenge. We love when people get what they deserve. We love when people get the revenge. See, but Jesus was dedicated to what? He was dedicated to redemption, not retribution. To the redeeming of us, of others. So how did Jesus do it? How? Like, I think it's a great question because, you know, as followers of Jesus, what we're doing is we're following Jesus and what, how Jesus lived his life. The call is to follow that same way, to follow the life of Jesus. Look at him and, and copy and, and learn how to live our lives in a similar capacity to how Jesus did. And one of the greatest examples of forgiveness in human history is Jesus. So if we want to learn how to forgive, we got to start to follow the way that Jesus did. And I see two ways. Now, I'm going to be honest. I can't even scratch the surface when it comes to forgiveness today. There's so much depth in it and so much to talk about. I can barely scratch the surface. But I want to encourage you, if forgiveness is something you're struggling with, the Bible is filled with answers. The Bible is filled with attitudes and the Bible is filled with ways to learn how to forgive. But I see, I want to go through two ways today that Jesus lived his life that got him to this place where he was on the cross, that prepared him for this moment, that allowed him to have a heart that was for people, even when they were in the middle of brutally murdering him on a cross. And number one is this, Jesus lived a life that was dedicated to the way. Dedicated to the way. So what is the way, right? This is kind of a common kind of concept throughout scripture, but Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So Jesus, when he's asked, you know, he's telling them who he is. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's saying, I'm the only way. There's gonna be other options. There's gonna be other opportunities. But Jesus is saying, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's not about our works. It's not about perfect church attendance. It's not about playing every single note perfect on the bass. It's not about perfection. It's about relationship with him because he is the way. If we want to get to where we're going, if we want to make it to the end of the road, we got to follow the way. Jesus is saying, I am the way. In fact, the way is mentioned several times in the book of Acts in connection with early followers of Christ. And it was to take prisoner men and women who belonged to the way that Saul or Paul went to Damascus. That's what brought him there was to come against these people who followed the way. And in this moment, and Jesus lived his life where the way to heaven, where the way to life was him. And so if we want to learn how to forgive we got to dedicate ourselves to the same way that Jesus lived. Jesus lived a life where what was his mission? To set us free and offer us forgiveness. His mission was to offer us forgiveness, to go to the cross instead of you and instead of my, me to bear our burden and to bear our sins so we could have a relationship with the Father. He was dedicated to living in this way. His entire existence was lived on this earth to set us free, to bring us to a place of deep forgiveness. See, the way of Jesus brings, brings freedom and transformational power. I think if you look at the testimonies in this room of what God has done in all of our lives, man, this is the reality. How much transformation have we seen take place in our own lives? How much transformation have we seen in the past 10 years, in the past five years, in the past three years, in the past six months? Have you seen that transformational power in your life? To be honest, forgiveness without Jesus is going to be very hard. It's going to be extremely difficult to learn how to forgive if we don't even understand what deep forgiveness has done in our own lives. 
that Jesus took me and went to the cross for me despite all of my stuff and all of my sin and all of my mistakes. He went for me and he went instead of me. And that testimony is so powerful. And I think once we experience the transformational power of the forgiveness that the Father brings, it's gonna be a lot easier to hand it out and show it to other people. See, Jesus dedicated his life to me and to the forgiveness of sins. He took, he took the wrath instead of us. He took our punishment. He took it so I didn't have to. And the question is why? The answer, because God so loved the world. Because God so loved you and God so loved me. Why should we sent his son to die so we could be forgiven? How did Jesus get to a place of this forgiveness? Because his life was dedicated to it. His entire life up until this point was pursuing this idea that forgiveness needs to reign in the lives of those who follow Jesus. And I think there's this story in John that really articulates this character, characteristic of Jesus in a story we may know well. It says this, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd, a crowd soon gathered and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. And they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? Now, that's a very unique situation to have happened, right? You show up to the temple, you're teaching, all of a sudden, this woman, likely naked, she's been caught in adultery, she's just thrown in front, even like, we should stone her. What do you think we should do? That's a unique situation. I've never had that happen before. I'm grateful. What should we do? What do you say? Remember Jesus, you read through it. How many times is this it? They throw a situation at Jesus' feet, and they say, what should we do? The law says, the truth is, but what do you say? We're gonna catch you someday saying they're doing something wrong. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. <laughs> but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Doesn't even say a word. It says they kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. That's his statement. If you've never sinned, go ahead. If you've never made a mistake, you've never had sin in your life, hey, by all means, start throwing the stones. And then he stopped down again, stooped down again and rode in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Where'd they go? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said this, neither do I. Go and sin no more. I think this is a powerful story. There's so much depth in this story. And there's so much speculation or Theology, we're trying to understand what exactly happened. You know, some people think, you probably heard this, that Jesus was writing down the sins of all the pe people in the crowd on the ground. So when he said, if you've never sinned, throw the stone, they look down, they're like, ooh. Some people believe that. And there's all these different ideas and what maybe was written down in the ground, but what he wrote in the ground obviously had enough power to change people's hearts and for them to walk away. And then he, he looks around, he's like, where are all your accusers? She said, there's no one here. He says, go and sin no more. I don't accuse you, go and sin no more. See, I want you to understand the beauty of this. Is that no matter what you've done, no matter the sin, no matter the brokenness, no matter the fear, no matter the busyness, no matter all of it, Jesus, I think, is saying to us, neither do I go and sin no more. I think sometimes we're so caught up in our own sin and our own brokenness and our own pain and our own shame. 
that we're walking around and we've never experienced that deep forgiveness that Jesus offers. And we feel so broken and we feel like we can't be used. And I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've been a pastor now over 10 years full time, which is remarkable. And it's, it's, even that doesn't make sense when you talk about this context, you know. Um, but as a pastor, how many times have I heard people say, either one of two things, man, God could never use me. Or they say something along the lines of, man, I didn't think God can use me, but look at me now. Look at me now. Look at who I was, the broken man who, who was struggling, who was sinning, who was broken. Look at me now. And I say that in not a prideful way, but in a way of thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness that you offered me. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done in my life. You know, there's so many times where I come up to share on a Sunday and I'm, as I'm coming up, my mind is, am I even qualified? What about the stuff in my life? What, what about all of it? What about my brokenness? And I feel like oftentimes Jesus just says, go and do what I've called you to do. Go and do it. Where are your accusers? He says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Even when we're standing in our sin, standing in the middle of our mess that we made, standing in the middle of our mistakes, humiliated and broken, Jesus will forgive us. Now that idea, I think I've been in church my whole life and I still sometimes have a hard time understanding why. Why? Like why forgive me? Like, I don't, I don't often get it, but man, am I grateful. I'm grateful that God chooses you and I to, build this, to help him build his church. I'm glad he uses you and I to, to love the people around us. I'm glad he chooses you and I in the midst of our brokenness to go and help change the world and bring life to the broken world. I'm grateful. Jesus will stand up for us. Jesus will fight for us. What if we were to dedicate ourselves to the same thing? Dedicate ourselves to the way. That no matter what obstacle, no matter what has happened to us, no matter what has been done to us or what has been said about us, we are in constant pursuit of making Jesus known and learning how to forgive quickly. That the forgiveness of Jesus is constantly on our lips and on our minds. Now, you know what? This is going to take work, right? It's not easy to forgive. It's going to take deep connection to Jesus. It'll take a, take a deep understanding of the forgiveness we have received. Do you understand it? Receive his forgiveness. And then go and do likewise. Pour it out to others. Let our forgiveness be a testimony of his goodness and his faithfulness. Because forgiveness, right, if you know, forgiveness is so countercultural right now. You know, we live in a space where they've called it cancel culture. Where, where, where people who have said things, maybe even 10, 15 years ago, it's being found and then people are getting kind of cut off. People are getting canceled. They're thrown out. And this just goes so against who Jesus is. I'm so glad that some of the stuff that I've said and put on social media in my life is no longer there. I hope. Because sometimes we, we're, we're not perfect people and I'm grateful. It goes against culture. I'm so glad that Jesus didn't cancel me. When he saw it, he's like, yo, no, you're out of here, bro. No chance for you. He forgave me. And he didn't abandon me. He found me. He looked for me. He didn't leave me broken, but he bandaged me. And I think the second thing that, that Jesus lived his life is this is a life dedicated to redemption. Like I said earlier, we love retribution. We love revenge. We love getting our way. We love it. But we don't often like it when someone else gets redemption when someone gets forgiveness on something we're like god i don't they don't deserve it though you know like 
you know what they said? <laughs> Were you sleeping when they said that thing to me? We love that. And do you know what redemption means? The action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. <laughs> saving. Being saved. So how is Jesus so able to forgive? Because that's who he is. That's what his purpose is. That's what his mission is. Forgiveness. So imagine with me how hard it must be when the people you gave your life for, the people you forgave for a multitude of sins, decide they won't forgive each other. Decide they're too hurt. Decide if that forgiveness isn't for them. And you know what's super sad about forgiveness and is how often it just unforgiveness creeps into the church and creeps into some of our best relationships. I mean, I've heard so many stories of churches who have split because of unforgiveness. People who, who, who had been hurt so much, so they said, I, I can't. I can't. How hard must it be when Jesus looks out? Now again, he's so gracious and so loving. I'm way more than I am. But I can imagine looking at him and like, come on. I did it for you. Can't you do it for them? In fact, in Matthew 18, verse 21 to 35, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone? We know the story. Likely you know this. How often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Peter, seven times. Whew. Now, Pete, he's exaggerating here, right? Seven, he's like, yo, like Jesus, like seven times. You think like that's cool, number of completion, you know, like being pretty spiritual. This is him, right? He's like, this is Peter. If you read through the Bible, Peter says and does the craziest things. Seven times. And he, again, he thinks he's being so holy here. And Jesus says, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, I don't know if Peter was a mathematician or not. I don't know. 70 times seven in my own brain is tough. I'll be honest. One of y'all knows the answer. I don't know the answer. 490. Thank you. That's more, that's more than one every day. Sometimes it's, with our kids, it's like, yo, God, give me the grace. Give me the grace, God, to forgive because I'm not happy right now, you know. Sometimes with our spouses or our friends, coworkers, bosses. Sometimes our bosses are the worst people when it comes to forgiveness, right? You're like, God, how come you have me in such a horrible, vile place? Did you see the words they said about me? 70 times seven. You know, it's tough to be a light in the darkness when we're always in the light. It's tough to be the salt of the earth when we're in a pile of salt all the time. That's a salty pile. A pillar of salt. I'm just joking, sorry. God, why do you have me in this situation? It's painful. Time to be a light. Maybe it's time to leave the, leave the darkness once there's another light burning there. Sometimes we're the only light in the dark room and sometimes we're the only light in a dark situation or in a dark environment. And what do we do? We don't just put a, a, our hat on and cover the light and just live our life like everybody else. We're quick to forgive. When people at work are talking bad about your boss, you say, no, they're awesome. I love them. We're not gossiping about our coworkers. We're saying, I love them. God loves them. God forgives them. And I'm not saying like, like just live in a place of like humiliation and trauma. That's not what I'm saying, but be a light. 70 times seven. 
Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. So his, or, his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. I'm glad banks work a little different today. I declare bankruptcy. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, sorry. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I'll pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he rele released him and forgave his debt. Wow. This is who we are in the story. We received the forgiveness from God and we received it. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment, an auto deposit. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset, of course. They went to the king and told him everything that happened. Then the king called in the man he, was, he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you a tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And then Jesus says this, this is powerful. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Hope you feel encouraged. <laughs> we need to learn how to forgive when it's painful, even when they don't deserve it. Now forgiveness is not telling somebody, hey, what you did to me is okay. All good. In fact, in our house, when we get Jane, when Jane says, I'm sorry, we don't say, it's okay. We say, we forgive you. I forgive you. Because it's not okay. Throwing your mashed potatoes all over my ceiling is not okay. I'm not cool with that. Asking for us to cook you food and then you're saying, I don't want it. It's not cool. It's not okay, but I forgive you. I forgive you. I think we've locked ourselves behind the door of unforgiveness and we've tried to throw away the key because we're like, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. We don't want to open ourselves up to the hurt. See, forgiveness can be painful. But what's on the other side of forgiveness? You know what it is? Freedom for you, not for them. We've trapped ourselves. We've locked ourselves behind the door thinking that we're causing pain to somebody else. The only pain that's being caused is in your own heart. The bitterness that's building up and the anger, the fear that builds up inside of us. I think we've been locked behind the door for far too long. It's time to unlock the door and take the step of faith to forgive them, to leave it in the past, to not carry that pain to our future. Now, I came across this story, a story of this guy named Reverend Casey, Casey Bukala, who's a teacher at John Carroll University in the United States. He says, there's a couple, Russ and Kathy returned home after a ski outing to be met by, by their son uh, and neighbors. And their son approached them to tell them that their other son, Rick, was murdered. It says, Rick ran into the woods after a would-be robber who tried to break into their garage. The robber turned, panicked, and shot their son dead. Kathy and Russ worked out earlier in their marriage, in their married life, the need to forgive each other in their personal dealings with each other. And they can't believe the news that they're hearing now. Their son is murdered. They go into their home after settling down in the panic and pain. They decide to pray. It says they, they feel an immediate peace of mind and heart and dispel any desire to get even with the perpetrator of this crime. 
The murderer of their son wasn't caught until a year later. And when he was, Russ and Kathy requested a visit with him. They met and spent time talking with him. They prayed with him. They forgave him. They, they, they worked for his parole and visited him in prison during his sentence. Russ and Kathy created a, created a heaven by forgiving the murderer of their son. And he says, Russ and Kathy, I invited them to my class, the ethics of forgiveness, some years ago to tell us their story. And it says, in the class, I asked the students for their reactions. And one student remarked, I think they went too far. I think they went too far to for forgive. Like, that's too much. And then he said this, I asked him, did Jesus go too far? What Russ and Kathy did is what Jesus wants us to do, 77 times or 70 times seven, which means always. It's a powerful story. It's not easy. It's not easy when we're face to face with pain and hard moments where someone's caused pain in our life or hurt the people we love. And it's not easy. You know, I don't know. If it was easy, Jesus hanging there on the cross, again, it was who he was. So for him, it may have been easy. For me, that's not easy. For Father, forgive them. We've got to learn how to forgive. And our takeaway today is really a question, which is this, who do I need to forgive today? I want to take a moment, maybe think about this week or today at lunch or whatever, who, do I, who might I need to forgive? Is there someone recently? Is there someone historically that I need to forgive? Is it my spouse that I need to forgive? So many things in our lives that are hard to forgive. Sometimes it's things that happened to us when we were children and we're still carrying the weight of it now. It might even be something that happened recently. But these things are holding us captive. Unforgiveness, I believe, is holding us captive. And we often think that the people who hurt us are holding the key to the door. And the reality is we've had the key the whole time. They're not holding the key. They don't have that power over your life. They don't have that control over your life, but we're letting them have that control over our life. Even though we're holding the key. See, bitterness oftentimes and fear and anger all hold us back from unlocking the door and stepping into the, forgi and the freedom that forgive forgiveness can bring. Who is it that maybe you need to forgive? Now, the second part of this is I want us to think about who we might need to apologize to. See, forgiveness doesn't require an apology, though. I want you to know that. It doesn't require an apology. You don't need to forgive someone only if they apologize for it. The likelihood of them apologizing is pretty low. You don't need an apology, but I want to encourage you. Let's be people who are humble. And if we've done stuff or we've said things and we need to apologize, let's do it. Let's apologize. Let's say, I'm sorry. You might need to apologize to your kids because of how you responded to them to this week. Or you might need to apologize to your spouse for how you spoke to them or what you did this week. You might need to apologize to your coworker for not getting the project done on time, even though you knew the deadline, you didn't get to it. You might need to apologize to your boss for your attitude towards them the past couple months. I don't know what it might be for you, but I want to encourage you, be humble. And let's learn to apologize when we inevitably mess up. That's what makes the healthiest relationships. Willingness to apologize. So those are the things. Who do I need to forgive? And who might I need to apologize to? God, I thank you, um, that, first of all, that you offered us this for deep forgiveness. Even though I couldn't earn, even though I don't deserve it, you forgave me anyway. You went to the cross and even that same prayer, Father, forgive them. And I thank you that I've received that forgiveness. God, help me pour it out too. Help me learn how to apologize. Help me learn how to forgive. God, help us learn how to be bold and take a step of faith out the door and learn how to forgive deeply. God, help us not just be carriers of that forgiveness, but also people who bring it with us wherever we go. 
In Jesus' name, amen.